Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here for today. So again, my name is Dan Camelon, and I am the founder of the Strength Coach Tutor. Today, we're going to do a quick anatomy and kinesiology review for the elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand. So let's go ahead and get started here. So we're going to work from the elbow and then go down or go distally. All right. So the first thing I'm going to talk about here is the elbow. So the bones that comprise the elbow joint truly are the humerus and the ulna. So you can see here how the humerus comes down and this will be called here the olecranon of the ulna sits almost in and around the distal part of the humerus here. So that's truly what's making up our elbow joint. That's what allows us to flex and extend our elbow. Another bone in this area is the radius, right? You can see the radial head here and it's really articulating with both bones, the humerus and the ulna. But the articulation between the humerus and the radius doesn't allow us to do really any flexion and extension. What's important is where this radial head sits in the radial notch of the ulna here, and that's what allows us to do pronation and supination and what forms our radial ulnar joint. So if we look at the wrist and hand, a lot more complex, a lot more going on, right? So let's start off um, with the radius and ulna again. So the radius and ulna are two parallel bones that run through the length of our forearm. So we were just looking at them up in the elbow and now we're gonna look at them down in the wrist. So it's really gonna form what we typically call our wrist joint is the distal part of our wrist along with this proximal row of these four small little bones of what we call the carpal bones. So these carpal bones are gonna be right at the base of your palm here. These eight little bones are fitting this small area right here, okay? So it's that articulation with the radius with these four small carpal bones there is a little bit of an art articulation where you see here the ulnar carpal joint. The ulna is going to articulate with some of those carpal bones as well, but you can see there's a much closer articulation in the radial carpal joint with the radius and some of these carpal bones here. Um, so right here where my cursor is, that's gonna be our thumb, and over on this side here is gonna be our pinky side. So there's two rows of four carpal bones each. All right, so there's a total of eight carpal bones. In the proximal row going from thumb side to pinky side, we first have the scaphoid, we then have the lunate, we have the trichretrum, and then on top of that, we have the piezoform. Now going to the distal row, we have the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the handmate. All right, and as we see here, these longer bones coming off of the, the carpal bones, these long bones are what we call the metacarpals. And so that's what actually makes up a lot of our palm here. So up above from the carpal bones, right before to the start of our fingers is gonna be the metacarpals, and the metacarpals is what really helps us form our knuckles here as well, all right? So now let's go on to the fingers here. So as we were just looking at our knuckles, so our knuckles are what we call the metacarpal phalangeal joints. So metacarpal meaning the metacarpals, phal phalangeal meaning these phalanges. So each of these small little bones past the metacarpals are known as phalanges. And so here with the thumb, thumb's gonna look a little bit different and we'll get there in a second. Um, but each of these bones here is the metacarpals, then everything past that is our uh, phalanges. So through the index finger to the pinky finger, we have three phalanges on each finger. Uh, we have the proximal phalange or proximal phalanx, the middle, and then the distal. And you can see that's the case for each one, all right? The one exception is that with the thumb, we only have a proximal and a distal phalanx. So there, we only have one joint instead of compared to the rest of the fingers, we have two joints, right? So right here, where each of these bends are is a joint, whereas the thumb, I just have the one, all right? So the two joints in our four lateral fingers, so the proximal joint here, or that first articulation between the proximal and middle phalanges, that's the proximal interphalangeal joint. The one that's close to the tip of our fingernails there is the distal interphalangeal joint. The thumb is a little bit different because we only have one, right? Because of that, we we're missing that middle phalanx in our thumb. We only have a proximal and distal phalanx and therefore there's only one joint being formed in, you know, beyond the metacarpal. So there we have what's called the interphalangeal joint. So there's no proximal or no distal, it's just interphalangeal joint. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the movements of the radio ulnar joint and the elbow joint. So we kind of talked about this quickly before, but at the elbow joint, we experience flexion and extension, right? So let's go ahead and play this video here. So when my arms are straight, when in the process of straightening my arms, 
that's going to be elbow extension. And in the process of bending or flexing my elbows, I'm going to elbow flexion. So right when my palms are coming up closer to my shoulder, that's going to be elbow flexion. And with the radial ulnar joint, so when my palms are up facing the sky, that's a supinated position. And when my palms are facing down towards the ground, that is a pronated position, all right? Another position that's technically not listed here, but it's what we call the starting position for the radial ulnar joint is if my thumbs are facing straight up towards the ceiling, that is what we call the neutral position. So imagine it's like you're doing like a type of hammer curl and your elbows are flexed at 90 degrees like they are in this video here. Thumbs pointing straight up would be a neutral position. All right, so this is, a, we're gonna go over each uh, series of joints here individually, but this is a good overview of all the joint actions at each of these joints and all the movements that they perform, all right? And this picture I think does a nice job of showing all of those as well, but we're gonna go ahead and look at these one by one. So let's look at the wrist first. All right, so again, this is the articulation between the radius and the ulna with that first proximal row of carpal bones. So first we're gonna look at wrist flexion and extension. So extension is when I bring my wrist up. Flexion is when I'm bringing my wrist down, okay? So in this picture here, right, I'm in a pronated position because my palm is facing down towards the ground, all right? This next one here, we're gonna look at radial and ulnar deviation or abduction and adduction, all right? So ulnar deviation, when my pinky is gonna move closer towards my ulna like that, and then when my thumb comes back towards my radius here, like that, that's going to be radial deviation. The last one is circumduction, and that's just simply moving your wrist in a circular motion. All right, so movement of the fingers. So just like the wrist, we can also flex and extend our fingers. So when I go ahead and make a fist, that's going to be finger flexion. And then when my fingers are splayed out or extended straight out, that's going to be finger extension. Let me just play this next one here. So here, when my fingers are spread apart like that, that's finger abduction. And when they come back together and all my fingers are touching one another, that's finger adduction. The last one here, again, just like the wrist going in that circular motion, is circumduction. All right, so the thumb, we just saw the thumb moving in all those same movements that we saw with the fingers, and it has all those same actions. But the only one that's different for the thumb is what we call opposition, and that's bringing your thumb towards your pinky. So you can see how it's going across your palm like that. All right, so the biomechanical fall here that we're gonna look at at the elbow is what we call cubital valgus and cubital varus. All right, so normally you can see here that the arm comes straight down and then there's a little bit of a deviation where the uh, radius and the ulna kind of deviate away from that line going straight down. So you can see here, what we call a normal carrying angle is about 15 degrees, right? Now someone with cubital valgus has an increased angle, right? So this angle is greater than 15 degrees, so here, imagine this, right? You can see how the upper arm is really close to the body, but now the radius and the ulna starts to deviate and almost turn away, if you will, um, from the rest of the body here. So you can see a larger gap between the forearm and the side of the body. Then this is easiest to see if you have someone starting in the anatomical position with their arms by their sides and their palms facing forward. Cubital, cubital varus is where you can see is the opposite of valgus where that form is actually getting closer to the side of the body. See how there's less of a gap here with varus, but now there's more of a gap here with valgus. All right, so let's look at uh, the primary elbow muscles. So if we're looking at the elbow flexors, right, so muscles are gonna help us start from an extended position up to bring our palms up towards our shoulders. Uh, the muscles that are gonna primarily be responsible for that are the biceps brachii, which we have a long and a short head. The long head is lateral, the short head is medial. We have the brachialis, which is directly underneath that biceps brachii. And then we have the brachioradialis, which is on our forearm. And it's most prominent when you're doing a hammer curl, so that mu long muscle that pops up almost creates like a ridge on the top of your forearm there, okay? In terms of the extensors, the primary extensor that we have is the triceps brachii. And so with the prefix tri, right? So there's three different heads, the triceps, whereas with the biceps, by meaning two, there are two heads. So with the triceps, there's three heads. Uh, we have the long head, which is gonna move to be on, on the medial posterior aspect. We have the triceps lateral head, which is gonna be on the lateral aspect, of course. 
And then there's also a tricep brachii medial head. So you can see these fibers coming straight down are going to be the long head. But these fibers are almost coming at like an oblique angle, if you will. Those are going to be the fibers of the tricep medial head. All right. Lastly, there's this tiny little muscle that does a little bit in terms of helping us with elbow extension. And that muscle is going to be the anconius, which is also permanently more so on our forearm, which you can see here. And again, it's a very small muscle compared to the triceps. All right, so let's look at the superficial forearm flexors. So pretty much uh, these muscles are going to flex the wrist, they're gonna flex the fingers, they're gonna do some sort of flexion. Um, and they're also gonna pronate as well. So a lot of the muscles that are on the anterior surface of, of our forearm are gonna do some sort of flexion, and then they're also going to do uh, pronation, all right? So we can see here, first off, pronator teres. It's coming off of the medial epicondyle, like the, most of these muscles are. They come off of that medial epicondyle on the inside of the elbow, and that's what's gonna help us pronator uh, forearm. The flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. So when you see flexor carpi, that means it's gonna flex the wrist, and carpi refers to the wrist, right? So we know it's gonna be a flexor, and it's gonna act on the wrist, therefore it's gonna act as a wrist flexor. Radialis, meaning that it's going to, a muscle's gonna be more on the radial side or closer to the radius, and it's also going to assist with radial deviation. Ulnaris, meaning it's gonna be closer to the ulna, and it's gonna help us with ulnar deviation. All right, so you can see how the radialis is more lateral, the ulnaris is more medial, and then in between those two is the palmaris longus, and this is a muscle here that actually not all of us have, but to test to see if you have it, if you bring all your fingers together, and then you flex your, um, trying not to create a shadow here, but if you can see that tendon pop up right there, that's, that would be the tendon of your palmaris longus. So again, you bring all your fingers together, flex your wrist forward, and the tendon should pop up in the middle of your wrist there. So let's go into the deep forearm flexor. So these are all the muscles underneath the ones we just looked at. All right, so these ones are gonna act a little bit more so on the fingers. So we can see the flexor digitorum superficialis and the profundus. They're gonna all help us flex our fingers, except for the thumb. When you see the term pollicis, that's when it's something that's gonna act on the thumb. So a flexor pollicis muscle is gonna help us flex our thumb. Then lastly, the pronator quadratus is right at the base of the wrist here, which you can see underneath some of these tendons here, it runs horizontally or transversely, if you will. Um, and because it has pronator in its name, it's going to, of course, help pronate the forearm. All right, now let's go on to the extensor. So let's look at the superficial forearm extensors. So same concept here, right? If something's a carpi muscle, it's going to act on the wrist. It, and now that we're looking at extensors, an extensor carpi is going to be an extensor of the wrist. Radialis and ulnaris, same concept there. All right, so the extensor carpi, radialis, longus, and brevis, both are going to extend and radi radially deviate the wrist. I should mention before, I apologize, digitorums are gonna act on the fingers. So flexor digitorums are gonna flex the fingers, extensor digitorum is going to extend the fingers or straighten them out, okay? Extensor copi ulnaris, again, extend the wrist and also ulnarly deviate the wrist. Last one here, a unique one, the extensor digiti minimi. That one is going to extend the pinky. So digiti, kind of relating to the finger, minimi meaning small. Our smallest finger is, of course, the pinky, so it's going to just extend the pinky. Now let's look at the deep extensors here. So first off, we have the supinator. This is close up to the elbow and almost wraps around on the inside of the uh, ulna there, if you will. But um, the supinator, just as the name implies, it's going to supinate the forearm. The abductor pollicis longus. So that abductor, right? So it's going to help us bring our thumb away from the rest of our hand. All right, so it's to help bring it away. We all have the extensor pollicis brevis and longus. So again, pollicis relating to the thumb still. This is gonna help us straighten out our thumb if it's bent. It's gonna help us straighten out, all right? So the abduction is bringing the whole thumb away. Extension is if it's flexed and then you're gonna straighten it, okay? The last one here is extensor indices and this is relating to your index finger. So this is going to extend the index finger. All right, so let's look at a couple exercise application here. And this is it's the same videos that we looked at before, but we're gonna relate it now to exercises, right? So if I'm going to do a bicep curl, right? My concentric action is if I'm fully extended, right? The dumbbells are down by my side like that, and I curl them upwards. 
I am concentrically flexing my elbows and thus the muscle that's going to perform those concentric actions are my elbow flexors, my biceps brachii, my brachialis, all right? Now, if the opposite, right, if I'm starting with my elbows flexed, right, I'm up like this, and then I'm in the process of pushing something down and away, then I'm going to be concentrically using my triceps brachii muscles, my elbow extensors, to help straighten my elbows back down towards my side, all right? Same idea with the wrist here, right? Now, when I'm bringing my wrist up like this, when it's pointing, starts off, excuse me, when it starts off down like such, I want to play this video. I apologize. So that process of it, me, say if I'm holding it down and I'm bringing my wrist up like that, that's going to be uh, concentrically doing wrist extension. And especially this is important because think of how gravity would apply, right? If I'm holding a dumbbell, gravity's gonna pull that weight down and I have to use my wrist extensors to bring it up. Now the opposite will be true. If I was in a supinated position, my palm was facing upwards, I'm letting my wrist hang like such, and then I have to curl upwards, that would be wrist flexion. I have to concentrically use my wrist flexors to overcome the resistance and to overcome gravity, okay? All right, guys, that is all for today in terms of the elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand. Hope you guys were able to get some value out of this. Um, looking forward, my next video is going to be how to solve math-related nutrition questions. And I think you guys will be able to get a lot of value out of this. So again, keep uh, following me on Instagram at thestrengthcoachtutor.com um, to help get more of your resources and anything you need. And again, check out our Google Classroom, all right? So again, follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the Strength Coach Tutor. And you can always send me an email at thestrengthcoachtutor at gmail.com. Thanks.